Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. All right, he spent more than three years in prison for charges he said were trumped up and wrong and unfair, uh, namely on wire fraud, obstruction of justice. We'll get into details in a second. Uh, bottom line, the president of the United States of this country gave him a call up in Canada to tell him, Conrad Black, I just pardoned you. There's more to it than that. But uh, the publisher joins me right now from Toronto, Conrad Black, Lord Conrad Black. Good to have you. Good to be back, Neil. So could you explain the process first off, how you found out about it? Uh, you mean how I found out that it was sort of in progress or how no, I found the, out the, that the it happened? The United States calls you, you got to call them in the White House, how that all went down. Well, I frankly, I assumed the lady who answers the phone for me said who was calling and I assumed it was a prank probably from one of the London newspapers, you know, the Daily Mail or something like that. They like to occasionally they try and, you know, you get through to Buckingham Palace claiming to be the head of some country in Africa or something. I thought it was <laughs> that sort of thing. And then I started out to say, is this a prank? And the, and the lady in the other end said, please hold for the president. And he came right on. So I knew it, unless it was Rich Little, it was the president. And then he said some things that made it clear it couldn't have been an impersonator. And, and uh, so I told him he did me great honor by phoning and he couldn't have been more gracious and he authorized me to say that his motivation in doing this was that the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone and the legal team, had, had looked through the material that Alan Dershowitz and others had sent on my behalf, legal, a legal analysis, and concluded that I never should have been charged and it was, in the, in the President's own words, a bad rap and an unjust verdict. So I was very, that of course is true, but it was extremely gratifying to have ultimately the, the highest authority in these matters come to that conclusion and take the decision he did. So I thanked him naturally profusely and we chatted for a few minutes and conversation ended after about 10 minutes. Well, you he probably had a common more, shared more bond about overzealous prosecutors there. Did he talk well, to you about Well, the names that? of a few of a few well-known uh, figures, uh, uh, at least one of whom he has described as a bad cop, came up. And just by complete coincidence and on a very trivial level, uh, I, I, I was contending with some of the same people who have been harassing him. So it, it would be an indiscretion of me to say exactly what was said. But more flattering things have been uttered about those people, I think, but probably less flattering also. Was James Comey among those people? Uh, he, he, he figured prominently in that part of the conversation, yeah. Um, one of the stipulations of this, I understand, uh, when you first uh, got out of uh, jail, was that you couldn't travel to the United States. Jails for, jails for the town drunk, Neil. I got out of a, a deluxe federal prison. The, the, uh, By the way, you were not yeah. at a country club, as I, I remember. Uh, no, no, I don't think they have country clubs in, uh, <laughs> you know, in that correctional system in your country. No, no, it, it, but it, it was fine. There was no violence. I mean, not nothing that affected me anyway. I had no problem with anybody, either the fellow residents or the but regime. But you couldn't travel no to the United States afterwards. Are you free to travel now to the United States? Yeah, no, I could if okay. I wished to apply. And 
I was assured that if I applied, I would be accepted. But I, because of the way I was treated by your legal system, and despite my great admiration for the United States, I didn't feel like applying. But but now, uh, as the president explained, the whole matter is expunged. I yeah. was officially never prosecuted, and I'm welcome to come and go like anyone else. No, you can't. And like undo- I, like I can with the other 197 countries in the world. But you can't undo those three years in prison. Are you are you bitter about that experience? I'm philosophical. I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I. You know. I agree with in many things. As you know, you kindly referred at times to a book I wrote about President Roosevelt, and he, his best answer at a press conference was, "What do you think of vengeance?" And he said, "I'm for it." Uh, you know, if, if, if there are a few people that I would, I, if I had the chance, I would. Uh, return the favor to them they showed me but in but it doesn't preoccupy me and I'm not bitter against the country it's the country and I you know it's a free country and you run it the way you want it but you've got terrible problems in the justice system let me ask you you mentioned a book you've written several books but among them was uh, Donald J Trump a president like no other it was a largely flattering book but I, I read that book it wasn't entirely flattering so I'm wondering no, if, I, the, if I, I, the president I, I, read it I mean and the perception was that you got this because you said some nice things about him but again I read that book it wasn't entirely all fawning. So did the president <laughs> explain to you why he did this and that did the book have anything to do with it? I have no reason to believe, Neil, that he read the book or even that he's aware that I wrote the book. The subject has never come up. He has occasionally let it be known through other people that, that are mutual friends that he was grateful for some of the things I've written about him in the National Review and on American Greatness. Uh, but, you know, those of us who, who uh, comment favorably on him are a few in quantity, but of the highest quality. It's down to Victor Hansen, Roger Kimball, and a few other people, including myself. And by the way, you were and, on this show many times throughout the, the campaign, I remember, being very complimentary on him, and he did have a chance to do what he did. Uh, but I'm just wondering now um, whether uh, you look at this whole experience and, and uh, any differently now, would you get back? into publishing in a big way. I mean, obviously you've written some very, you know, big books, big historical biographies and the rest. What do you do now? Well, I, I'm, I'm still writing, and uh, I'm not on American Affairs now, but, uh, at, you know, I, I write three columns a week in one country and another, and, and, I, and, I, and I do write books. That's one good thing that came of all that. You've got plenty of time to write, and it's also a great way of taking your mind off the problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, on that, I am actually a historian, and what I wrote about President Trump was just as objective as what I wrote about President Roosevelt and President Nixon. If you want to keep a reputation, you can't be a propagandist and a whitewasher. And I pointed out some of the soft points in his career, but I don't. I don't think he is even aware I wrote the book, and uh, and and, I, and certainly it's never come up between us. So he told me that his reason was the motive I said, but that's what I do, and I'm rebuilding my fortunes, but not in the publishing business and not in public companies. It is Tuesday, the 21st of May of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesday's just a slight dash of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Indeed it will, folks. If you have the Spanish kind, which few do, but if you happen to, it works equally as well. And I would submit you may not even be able to tell the difference. Really. I mean, if people can't tell the difference, and I actually uh, mentioned this on social media yesterday, people are not able to tell the difference after the fact. When you've cooked saffron rice and you're out of saffron and you use turmeric, and turmeric will color the rice exactly like saffron does. Exactly. And everybody's convinced it's saffron. Okay? If you have the Spanish hot smoked paprika, no one will know. Anyway, here's a little bit of advice. Don't use your sea salt for the cooking. It's too expensive. Please, use your regular salt. If you're worried about the iodine in the regular salt, which I have to tell you, people are getting uh, iodine deficiencies because there's no iodine added to the sea salt. All right. But really, it's way, way, way too expensive to be using to throw it in the pasta water. Use a less expensive salt. 
the gourmet salt doesn't need to be in the pasta water. Please. All right. In fact, don't use your sea salt in any fashion as for cooking. It's too expensive. Okay, got that off my chest. What else is on my chest? Well, <laughs> Donald Trump, of course. When does it ever stop? He had another one of his Nur- uh, worthy. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a Nuremberg rally. This time in Pennsylvania. I wonder if it was at Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. Let's get one of those. I That's where I have been uh, advocating for the new trials, the Nuremberg trials in Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. And uh, Stephen Miller and others will be attending <laughs> under court order, which reminds me, can Don McGahn really ignore the subpoena to come and testify because Trump said he doesn't have to? He's a private gosh darn citizen now. I just uh, know, and as I mentioned on social media earlier, if I ignored that bench warrant for, well, let's just say all those parking tickets, because the judge is a Federalist Society judge appointed by Trump, I really don't think that's going to fly. I think that my rear end would be in jail. It would. So I don't understand how Trump can go out into the world and say, oh, well, uh, that we, we can just ignore the D.C. panel appellate decision because Merrick Garland, a Democrat, is on there. Yeah, an Obama judge. He's an Obama judge. We, we, we can ignore any decisions from an Obama judge. All right. Do you see how they move the goalposts? Democrats can't investigate Trump over these matters. So they brought in Mueller, who's a lifelong Republican, was the Republican FBI director, my God. And uh, I don't know. He's a lawman. He's following the law and following the evidence where it leads and found out that Trump is pretty much a traitor, like everybody uh, said he was, because he was doing it right out in the open. And then how Mueller was no longer a Democrat or a Republican. He was now one of the angry Democrats. Angry Democrats. Have you ever met a Democrat that was really angry? Come on. We are the most weak need, bleeding hearts. We weep at the slightest provocation. They are the ones that are always angry. Look at Trump's face. He is the angry man. And the angry people love it because they've been wanting to express their anger for a long time. And when they would, they always felt at least there was a little bit of societal pressure on them that they felt. Now they feel none. So Trump is at his Nuremberg rally in Pennsylvania telling lie after lie. You got Trump's spokeswomen and yeah. Kaylee, I'm looking at you. Which reminds me, how did Kaylee get her Harvard degree? Did her parents bribe Harvard officials to get that Harvard law degree? Because she is, I don't get it. (laughs) I'm just saying. A Harvard law degree? They must not mean much anymore. Like the rest of the Ivy League education. Didn't Bush go to uh, Yale? Yeah. I guess an Ivy League education doesn't mean much anymore. Did it ever? (laughs) So, yeah, you got Kaylee out there, spokeswoman, telling lies about, oh, Obama didn't save the economy. Trump didn't inherit the Obama great economy. He inherited the Obama bad economy. The economy was terrible before Don came and righted the ship. No, he's a kleptomaniac and he's stealing right and left. And he's a liar. There's no denying it. I would also presume that maybe Democratic leadership should start thinking about saving democracy rather than saving, well, a few votes. If you save democracy, you will be able to save the votes. If you don't save democracy, the votes don't mean a thing. So, um... There was a... uh, Apparently there was uh, quite a raucous caucus... (laughs) <laughs> last night among Democrats. And, uh, 
you you have some saying, you know, I go into my uh, into my district and no one ever talks about impeachment. No one ever talks about the Russians. All they want to talk about is the economy. Well, they're talking about the economy. And I got to tell you, people are talking about impeachment, too. Because the question remains, if a Democrat was president and did a fraction of what Trump has done, took monies from foreign governments at a Democrat's owned, ho- that Democrat's mo- hotel that they own, direct payments from them. If a Democrat as president, uh, tape came out, said, I like to grab him by the P and there's not anything they can do about it because I'm a star. Rest assured that if a Democrat had done a fraction of any of that, Nancy Pelosi would push for impeachment. She would. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, at the top, of course, that was Conrad Black. Yeah, Canadian Conrad Black. And he hadn't been pardoned for even 24 hours before Neil Cavuto invited him on Fox to attack the FBI and the U.S. court system. All right, let's not forget the crimes of Conrad Black. Ten years as a Chicago Sun-Times owner, and he looted that. He took 97% of all of that revenue, of all of the ownership, and pocketed it. And they even turned off the escalators to save on electricity and maintenance. While the management team was pleading poverty, and Conrad Black was looting the company. And he got caught, and he got uh, sentenced to six and a half years for fraud, embezzlement, and uh, what? Corporate looting. That's not a legal term, but what the legal term is for that. Theft? (laughs) Six and a half years. Served three, deported back to Canada. But what else has Conrad Black been doing in the interim? Because he was cited as, oh, he wrote this great uh, uh, biography on FDR. Well, he also wrote a fluff piece about Donald Trump that Donald Trump had read to him. Because Donald Trump doesn't read. He does have my struggle next to his bedpost. Uh, He does read that. Interesting, isn't it? But he didn't read Conrad Black's fluff piece on him he had it read to him and he loved it that's how you get a pardon for trump laud him conrad black should never have been pardoned in fact he should have served as full six and a half years in this reporter's opinion what's on the rest of the menu here in the bistro cafe well republicans are undermining michigan's redistricting effort The Pence Mafia is working behind the scenes to kill women's health care. And Democrats demand a review of Putin ally Oleg Deripaska's big new investment in Mitch McConnell's home state. Pay for play. Quid pro quo. After the break, we then move to the chef's table where the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning about data threats from Chinese-made drones. And a group of reporters and their editor at the Russian daily Kommersant resigned en masse against the firing of two colleagues over a report on a reshuffle of Putin's closest allies. Well, mob allies in the Russian mob, but close allies nonetheless. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit.
the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right-ish of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Link. And thank you, Kelly. Oh, and uh, she is uh, making the arrangements to get to the latest Netroots Nation. So uh, look for her there. And uh, we'll have some sort of presence indeed. So thank you, Kelly, for taking care of the chat room link for us. If you would then take a look to the leftish of the page at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the link to become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. If you could afford even really a latte espresso type coffee drink once a month, that amount goes a long ways for us to be able to pay our bills and also put funds aside to purchase newish machinery since this machinery is wearing out. Uh, We had to get newish machinery about halfway in our, so far it's been eight years. So about four years ago, we had to get newish machinery. And now this, this uh, group is starting to wear out and, uh, and it looks like we better make plans before they just uh, go kaput And you have, I don't even want to say the terrible things that happen when you get the blue screen. I don't, oh God, I even said blue screen. Well, nonetheless, folks, uh, thank you for your generosity and keeping us resisting for these past eight years. And uh, your generosity will continue to allow us to do the same for the next eight years. Five terms. Hey, we'll be here for five presidential terms at least. At least, <laughs> not like Donnie. Is he? Does he's too old to take on another five terms? <laughs> I don't know. I think that speed he's taken really makes him feel healthy. Uh, it always does. All right. So thank you so much for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it's simple. You can go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that platform, and we are forever grateful that he does. Follow me on Twitter. At Justice Putnam, pick, um, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and then get that linked up on social media. You can pick up podcasts. Well, before you get podcasts, you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. I'll get this out. Really, just bear with me now. Okay, follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. Podcasts can be found by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. And they're all out there. Man, I went to uh, one of the metrics uh, things that we have here, and I'm amazed how many different uh, ways people pick up podcasts. There's there's a lot of, I, I guess you call them platforms or something, but there's a lot of ways to, to do that. And people from around the world uh, pick up podcasts in any number of ways from from platforms, systems that I I have never heard of before. But I'm an old guy, you know, so not a millennial. All right. I'm older than a millennial and I'm right at the end of the boomers. So don't blame me for all the boomers, please. Anyway, the boomers. Well, that's a whole other story. We shouldn't get into that story. Let's not. (laughs) All right. What we should do is get right into these offerings here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy because even though we be a salon, we got to get out of here at a certain time. Uh, Danielle McLean of Think Progress does bring us this first offering here. Michigan Secretary of State yesterday, Monday, accused Republican lawmakers of undermining the state's redistricting process by using budgeting gimmicks and political sleight of hand to circumvent the will of the voters. Well, that's what the Republicans do. Look, they've been in cahoots with the Russians for a lot longer than we're giving them credit for. All I, I made mention when all those old Soviet fighters seem to have adopted the Soviet 70 year model when they went after the New Deal. So now we have reports that Putin and his folk were actively pursuing racial disharmony in the United States to the point of trying to recruit 
black people to go fight for some cause in Africa in which then they would get the training or whatever, then send them back here and have them destroy America from within. Black people are going to kill you in your sleep for all the things you've done to them. Wow. Russians learn quick. And it didn't even take them 70 years. Think about that. Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, a Democrat, slammed proposals by GOP-controlled legislators that would underfund a new independent redistricting commission approved by voters last November. You know what's funny? Is that there's been arguments about, well, we'll just defund uh, Munchen's Treasury Department until he, co- until he comes to heel and uh, acknowledges the subpoena and comes and testifies. But of course, since we play by the rules, and that would be a terrible precedent to set, because if we did it, you know. What? (laughs) The Republicans are already doing it. We won't because we're good neighbors. They'll do it because they want to get what they want, and they don't care how they get it even if it means taking laundered Russian rubles from the NRA. Benson claimed that a Senate-approved budget contravenes the will of the voters while a House version that underfunds the redistricting effort resorts to budgeting gimmicks. But both of these approaches are unacceptable, she said. The legislator must stop playing games with democracy and must fully fund both the Department of State and the Commission. Well, gerrymandering in Michigan mirrors Republican tactics across the country that seek to redraw voting precinct boundaries to GOP advantage as the party vies to hold on to power despite losing ground at the ballot box. People hate them in vast numbers. But if you can dilute their vote, which is called gerrymandering, you get to stay in power. It's called the tyranny of the minority. How else do we get these draconian War Against Women Anti-Abortion Laws. Ever notice how strong and wrong always destroys weak and right every single time? We ought to start expressing a little bit of strength with our correctness. If we're going to get slapped across the face, we don't necessarily have to respond in exact kind, but we also don't have to take it. Weak and correct never gets anywhere. Strong and wrong does, but it doesn't have to. Let's be strong and correct. Let's stand up truly for what we need to do to protect our democracy. All right, let's get on to this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Emily Singer of Share Blue Media brings us this offering. Well, it turns out Pence has been up to something other than praising Trump's broad shoulders. Yeah, I have a little question about Mikey. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I'm sure that he and mother have a pool boy stashed somewhere. You just know it. Well, you know what he has stashed is a bunch of his cronies at the Department of Health and Human Services to gut women's health care. The Pants Mafia, and that's what they're called. He's been quietly working behind the scenes to carry out the Trump administration's goal of gutting funding for women's health care, which Pence helped accomplish by installing allies from his days as governor of Indiana which Political described as a cadre of officials that one HHS official called the Indiana Mafia. Installing allies whom he had relationships with back in Indiana, such as HHS Secretary Alex Azar, Surgeon General Jerome Adams, and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrator Seema Verma have helped Pence push for one of his key priorities, defunding Planned Parenthood. Now that he's in the White House, 
Pence helped install new rules for Title X, a federal program that helps fund family planning services that would effectively cut Planned Parenthood off from crucial federal dollars that provide these reproductive health and family planning services. And we all know that defunding Planned Parenthood has been a rallying cry for Republicans because they're a bunch of lizard brains. They have no critical thinking skills at all. All you have to do is stimulate something, trigger them, trigger them. And they've been they've been programmed to hear Planned Parenthood and they get triggered. They want to eat. They want to destroy Well, given that Planned Parenthood runs roughly 40% of the Title X clinics in the country, cutting the group off from funds would have a devastating impact on women, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. They are pretty much successful, I would say, in turning back the clock on six decades of social progress and advancement. They didn't like the Renaissance, folks. The dark ages aren't dark enough for them. Final offering here in the Bistro Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is brought to us by way of Daily Coast and the great Joan McCotter. Indeed. Congressional Democrats are demanding that the Trump administration review the $200 million investment Russian conglomerate Rusal is going to be putting into a Kentucky aluminum rolling mill. Rusal and the American firm Brady Industries announced last week both companies' boards of directors had approved the deal. Rusal also announced it will be supplying aluminum for the mill from a new smelter under construction in Siberia. Wow. I guess, uh, is that, would that be a lateral move in In the corporation, if you were transferred from Kentucky to Siberia, I wonder. For Democratic lawmakers, this is is all a big problem, considering Rousseau had been under sanctions until just about four months ago. The sanction had been imposed because the company, along with others under sanction, is owned and controlled by Deripaska, the oligarch who is close with Vlad Putin and who is still personally under sanction by the USA. A document detailing the agreement between Brady and Rousseau shows that Rousseau's parent company, E.N. Bluss, is still under Deripaska's majority ownership, along with some of his allies. Given that E.N. Plus is a company substantially owned by individuals and entities with close ties to the Russian government, the Democrats wrote sternly to Treasury Secretary Steve Munchen, We believe the proposed transaction warrants immediate review by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Well, careful Congress watchers will remember that Kentucky Senator and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell led the way for the lifting of sanctions on the Russian companies, including Rusal. And here's a revelation from lobbying filings that can turn your stomach. Just before the April announcement, David Vitter... Was he? Well, my question is, question is, was he wearing the diapers or not wearing the diapers when they got the Russian uh, active measures com- compromat on him with the Russian hookers? I don't think there was pee involved, but there was some spanking. A former Republican senator who was being paid to lobby for EN Plus reached up to give McConnell a heads up about the announcement. Russia remains a central threat to the U.S., the Democrats reminded Munchen after their 
what reminded Munchen in their stern letter, it's very stern in this reporter's opinion. The proposed investment by EN Plus, a company that is majority owned by a U.S. sanctioned Russian national and a Russian state bank in an American aluminum mill, raises serious questions of national security. But that's a threat that McConnell seems perfectly fine with and inviting into his home state. Okay, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, you know we're going to go through weather from around the world. And we're going to finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. You're probably not too interested in what some people call ABC gum, already been chewed. But for archaeologists, such gum, as long as it's really old, is a genetic goldmine. It's a bit like, uh, I guess, Jurassic Park. Natalia Kashuba, a graduate student in archaeology at Uppsala University in Sweden. She's referring to that famous clip from the movie about how Jurassic Park scientists extract blood from a mosquito trapped in amber. Bingo. Dino DNA. Except in this case, it's human DNA. And it's not trapped in amber, but inside exceptionally old chewing gums, found at the site of an ancient hunting and fishing village on the west coast of Sweden. The samples look like chewed-up wads of modern-day gum. But don't think Wrigley's. This detritus is black, sticky tar, distilled from birch bark. Kashuba has tasted modern-day versions and isn't eager to try it again. Not unless I'm paid for it. (laughs) So why chew on something so unpleasant? Maybe because their gum wasn't for fresh breath. You could use it to seal your boat or like seal your pots. So it was kind of an everyday use substance. Many of the gums have teeth marks too. So perhaps they chewed it to help shape it and in turn developed a habit, despite the taste, that today's tobacco chewers might relate to. Kashuba's team extracted and sequenced DNA from the ancient gum, and they found genetic evidence of three different gum chewers, two women and a man. It's the oldest human DNA found in Scandinavia, dating to about 8,000 B.C. And because it more closely resembles the DNA of hunter-gatherers from Western Europe than from Eastern Europe, it also provides hints about how people ended up in what's now Sweden. The results are in the journal Communications Biology. The gum could still hold other clues, about ancient diets or the bacteria these people had in their mouths. So given that we can learn so much from chewing gum, is it really that bad to stick it to the bottom of chairs and tables? You know, for the benefit of future archaeologists? No, I still think that one should not spit it out any place just like that. <laughs> so I think you should definitely throw it in the bin. But I won't blame these guys who, who spat it out 10,000 years ago. They did a good job then. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your health care provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? 
It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of NetRoots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1949. That was a very important day for workers on the islands of Hawaii. It marked the passage of the Federal Hawaii Employment Relations Act, more popularly known as the Little Wagner Act. The Wagner Act had granted the right to unionize to most non-agricultural workers in the United States. The Little follow-up to the act extended the right to join a union to Hawaiian agricultural workers. The International Longshoremen and Warehousemen Union were instrumental in pushing for this legislation. Robert Kumanera, who had worked on the island of Koloa, reflected on the significance of the right to join a union, saying, It was not a matter of wages and conditions, but pride. Because when you say you work for the plantation, you were pitied that it was synonymous with $1 a day and that you were living in one old plantation shack. So, union, to me, union is pride. One year after winning the right to organize, sugar plantation workers participated in a massive strike. Some 26,000 workers embarked upon a 79-day strike against the plantation bosses, effectively shutting down 33 of 34 plantations on the island. The strike was seen as a turning point for labor relations in Hawaii. Workers across ethnic lines joined together in solidarity against the paternalistic plantation system. During the strike, the workers received broad community support. As Kumanero stated, it was a matter of pride for the workers. In 1943, before the Little Wagner Act, there were 13 labor contracts in Hawaii. By 1947, that number had multiplied to 166 labor contracts. Union representation was now a reality for Hawaiian workers, and there was nothing little about that. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. On Tuesday, the entire Congress will be briefed on the intelligence behind the administration's warnings that Iran could strike U.S. interests in the Middle East. Donald Trump has threatened the official end of Iran, while Iran says it has quadrupled its production of enriched uranium. Trump spoke to reporters Monday evening. He said, I think Iran would be making a very big mistake if they did anything. If they do something, it will be met with great force. But we have no indication that they will. In domestic news, Don McGahn will not appear on Capitol Hill on Tuesday and plans to, quote, respect the president's instruction to defy a congressional subpoena setting off a new round of calls to get the ball rolling on impeachment proceedings against the president. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler told CNN on Monday night that the committee would hold ex-White House counsel Don McGahn in contempt if he didn't appear to testify as scheduled on Tuesday. You're dealing with a lawless president who is willing to go to any lengths to prevent testimony uh, that might implicate him, that does implicate him. What do you do next? We're going to look at all our options. Well, first thing we're going to do is hold uh, McGahn in contempt. And then we're going to have to pass a resolution in the House enforcing our contempt citations against Barr and McGahn and uh, seek to enforce those subpoenas in court uh, through the contempt citations. That's the next step. McGahn's lawyer said that Trump unambiguously directed his client not to comply with the committee's subpoena for testimony. Nadler called Trump's actions an example of, quote, dealing with a lawless president who is willing to go to any lengths 
to prevent testimony that could implicate him. The recalcitrance of the president and his lawless behavior is making it more and more difficult to ignore all alternatives, including impeachment. Nadler told CNN, adding that Trump is not above the law and saying that Congress may indeed pursue impeachment. Well, as more members of the Democratic caucus believe that impeachment is imperative at this point, Speaker Nancy Pelosi continues to dismiss the possibility. According to Politico, a group of members pressed her on Monday to move forward on impeachment proceedings, which she, along with multiple leadership allies, rejected. Politico reporting that Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, a former law professor, said he wasn't advocating impeaching Trump, but suggesting that opening an impeachment inquiry would strengthen their legal position while allowing Democrats to move forward with their legislative agenda. MSNBC's Mika Brzezinski interviewed Speaker Pelosi and asked her directly about her reticence to move forward with an impeachment inquiry, even in the wake of a Republican finally saying that Trump committed impeachable offenses. News of the day, Justin Amash's position on impeachment, he's tweeted more today. He's come right back at the president. Does it, it, does it fit the bar for bipartisan support for impeachment? Well, the bipartisan support for impeachment has to be in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Congressman Amash, His uh, voice speaks to the silence of so many other, all the other Republicans not to hold this president accountable for the oath of office that he takes to protect and defend the Constitution, respecting the co-equal branches of government. So uh, Amos may be one voice, uh, but the fact that it is... In the absence of other voices, it speaks very loudly. U.S. District Judge Amit Mehta blocked Trump's bid to withhold from House Democratic investigators his financial records held by an accounting firm he retained as a New York businessman, giving House Democrats a victory, finally, in their bid to unearth a trove of financial information about the president. The judge in a 41-page ruling said that Congress was well within its rights. I'm going to read a line from this opinion where he said that history has shown that congressionally exposed criminal conduct by the president or a high-ranking executive branch official can lead to legislation. He also, in that opinion, cited the Watergate investigation. This is a huge win for the House committees that have been seeking Donald Trump's financial records. Trump panned the decision, pointing to Meta being a judge appointed by former President Obama in 2014 and calling it, quote, crazy. And now there are five. A fifth child died in Border Patrol custody after being detained, this time for a week. Carlos Gregorio Hernandez Vasquez was detained after crossing the border without authorization near Hidalgo, Texas. He was set for placement in a shelter when he told staff he wasn't feeling well. A nurse practitioner determined the teen had the flu, and Customs and Border Protection officials say Border Patrol agents went to a pharmacy to pick up medication. The next day, he was found unresponsive. The cause of death was not known, and the case is allegedly under review, officials said. The 16-year-old is the fifth Guatemalan minor to die after being apprehended at the southern border since December. Four have died in custody and one died in a hospital. More than 52,000 people are now being detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, an apparent all-time high. And finally, on Tuesday, abortion rights protesters are trying to stop the recent wave of anti-abortion laws. They're holding hashtag Stop the Bans protests Tuesday at noon local time in nearly 50 states. I got the- And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, 
where it is currently, 51 degrees Fahrenheit, we are expected a high of just around 60, maybe a little bit less. We have copious amounts of water falling from the sky, almost like a river of water above us. Wow! And uh, it's going to continue that way throughout the day and night, bringing with it about a half an inch of rain today, uh, another quarter of an inch tonight, and then uh, we should have, eh, well, partly sunny skies tomorrow, morning clouds, afternoon sun. Right now the winds are out of the south at a negligible 1 to 2 miles per hour, though I must say that forecast is only a forecast because the actuality is that we've been getting some gusts Oh, just by uh, my weather machine here uh, on at, at the mothership couple of the data weather stations that I have that are not plugged in to share on uh, the weather underground, by the way, alas, but, uh, I'm getting wind speeds of, uh, of about five miles an hour with gusts about 20. Well, the winds will shift out of the Southwest in about an hour or so, and will increase at steady winds at five to 10 miles per hour. And those gusts will be uh, then probably about 30 miles per hour. We'll see. So we'll have rain all day, showers early tonight, continuing tonight, and winds will then shift out of the west, northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then uh, we may, oh, I should mention very quickly, uh, there is a slight chance of thunderstorm activity in the area, and that sometimes can knock out the power here. If that's the case, uh, bear with us. Uh, the infrastructure is as it is. But uh, they'll get that power turned back on right quick. They will. Though the actual uh, forecast for thunderstorm activity is later on in the week. And hopefully that will pass as well. Or if it does, it doesn't impact our grid. I keep my fingers crossed. All right. Weather from around the world, except I haven't finished up the local weather yet, have I? Well, grass pollen is very high. The air quality index is at 10 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is at 6, so put on some sunscreen. Barometric pressure is holding steady in the region at 29.47 inches. Visibility is down to 4 miles. And relative humidity is at 99%. Wow. We're almost breathing water. Okay. Now, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 71 degrees and sunny. Paris is 70 degrees and mostly cloudy. Rome is 68 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 72 and fair. Kabul is 74 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 72 degrees with a rain shower. Tokyo is 65 degrees and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 64 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees cloudy with a wind advisory. So take care on the bay and offshore. Oh, and a flood watch as well. River of water over them. And New York, New York is 66 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. David Shepherdson of Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. DHS has warned U.S. firms of the risks to company data from Chinese made drones, according to a notice reviewed by Reuters yesterday, Monday. 
The notice, titled Chinese Manufactured Unmanned Aircraft Systems, warned that U.S. officials have strong concerns about any technology product that takes American data into the territory of an authoritarian state that permits its intelligence services to have unfettered access to that data or otherwise abuses that access. Are they coming after American drones, too? I dare pray tell. A spokeswoman... According to Reuters, that's what they're calling her, uh, for DHS's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Is that an acting spokesperson, woman? Confirmed that it recently released an industry alert providing organizations with information related to the inherent risks associated with using UAS technology manufactured in China and measures to reduce such risk. Oh, are you doing something or not? The notice, which did not name any companies, was reported earlier by CNN. It urged companies to be aware of whether your data is being stored by the vendor or other third parties. You mean like Facebook? If it is being stored, find out how, where, and for how long. This is the latest concern raised by the U.S. government about the threats of Chinese-made devices. China's SZDJI Technology Company Limited, the world's largest maker of consumer drones, said in a statement yesterday, Monday, that the security of our technology has been independently verified by the U.S. government and leading U.S. businesses. The company added that it gives customers full and complete control over how their data is collected, stored, and transmitted. It said that for government and critical infrastructure customers, we provide drones that do not transfer data to DJI or via the Internet. In other words, if you don't opt out... You popped it in. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle. C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Tim Balmforth, also of Reuters, brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A senior editor and 10 journalists at Russian daily newspaper, Commerçant, said yesterday, Monday, they were resigning to protest against the firing of two colleagues over an article about a reshuffle of Vladimir Putin's close allies. The resignations involving Commerçant's entire political staff highlights tensions between publishers and newspaper staff in Russia's closely controlled media landscape, which is dominated by pro-Kremlin state outlets. In other words, why is Fox having all these Democrats on their station? That's not how state TV is supposed to be run. It is not clear over what the disagreement over the article was, which uh, named... Uh, Valentina Matryenko, Speaker of the Upper House of Parliament, could be replaced by Sergei Nirshkin, head of the SVR Foreign Intelligence Service, in the coming months. And that was then deemed rumors by uh, Vladimir Putin's people. And then the next thing you know, those uh, colleagues of theirs got fired, the, the Commerçant's colleagues, Renata Yambeva, a deputy chief editor overseeing business news who did not resign, blamed the firings on Uzmanov and one of his representatives, uh, Strashinsky, denouncing the sackings as outside pressure on the newspaper. Maybe there was someone among our readers who can explain to Uzmanov and Sharonitsky that right now they are destroying one of Russia's best media. And... Uh, well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period, but Netroots Radio broadcasts on. 
We'll meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesday, so do stay tuned all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver